First of all, thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me here. It's a, it's a phenomenal set of people. And you know, it's very difficult to actually come on stage. Uh, you know, Harsh has been one of those entrepreneurs that uh, you know, uh, when you're growing up, you have, you've heard about him and you've learned by watching him. And to come in and speak today in his presence is, a, is an honor in itself. So I thank you for, for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, but uh, you've been a hero for many, many entrepreneurs out there. I was also a little worried that he mentioned that you know, the age of entrepreneurs every year is going down. That is fine. That, I think, is a good part. I was just worried about the scores that he mentioned after that. And I just hope the scores do not continue to go down in the same proportion, because then I am pretty sure the next time a younger guy is not getting invited. So I'll try my best to keep the scores up there. But before I begin, I actually have to share something. You know, um, this place, this, this Grand Hyatt is a very special place for us. Um, and I'll, I'll narrate a small story before I, uh, you know, I go deeper into my talk. You know, 11 years ago, I think when we were just starting off, there were three of us. Uh, we obviously had no money. And we didn't have, and, and you know, and Bombay is, you know, hot and uh, humid and it's raining. And you also have to you know, appear as if you're like stud, whereas you have nothing. Right? You have nothing and you're just starting off. Uh, and so there was only one hotel at that point of time that had free Wi-Fi, where you sit in its lobby. And that used to be Grand Hyatt. So we would come in every day and sit in Grand Hyatt lobby, take the AC, but not drink the coffee, because the bloody coffee was 800 rupees. And there was no way we could afford an 800 rupee coffee. So that there were three co-founders. We had our turns. Ek subah pita tha, ek dupair mein, aur ek sham ko. It was still cheaper than actually going and taking some place. So we spent almost three, four months here, by the way, um, and didn't, didn't go out. So now when I came in today, by the way, I was staying in the room, I actually I didn't need the Wi-Fi, but I bought the Wi-Fi. <laughs> I was like, I have to pay, I have to pay back. But it also shows how cheap I am. I'm still you know, an entrepreneur. I only gave the Wi-Fi back. I didn't do anything else. <laughs> All right, so on that note, look, I, I'm going to try and share my journey of Inmobi. It's been now 11 years uh, that we started the company. And uh, it's, been, it's been a great ride. Uh, loved loved every, every moment of, uh, of what we have done. But as, I, as I've always reflected back in our own story, I think the story is more of failures than of successes. It's more, it's, it's a story of, you know, you know, learning from your failures and hopefully not repeating those failures. I think the, you know, that's the only thing that we have tried to do is to not repeat our failures. So at times when people ask, look, you know, it's, it's great that you succeeded, it's like, okay, wait a minute, you know, that's just like one blip. Because there are like way too many of those failures in between that one blip of success that kicks in. So if I go all the way back, I think, I think it's 2000, you know, late 2007, 2008, when we actually uh, decided that we wanted to do something. The only thing we had was what I would call a dream. And the dream, frankly, was, you know, and, and that, at that, in those days, you know, being an entrepreneur was not the in thing. You know, it was not seen as, you know, sign of success. It was seen as if, you know, you don't have anything else to do, so therefore. And the dream was, you know, in, in contrast to the middle class upbringing. The middle class upbringing didn't support the dream to be an entrepreneur. The middle class upbringing supported the dream to be, to find the safety net of life. And that safety net of life was the, and, and you were dealing with that dichotomy to say, how do, I, how do I deal with this? How do I tell people that this is, something that legitimately I want to do. And obviously people thought that you know, you're, you're foolish and you know, you're absurd and you know, something must have happened that you didn't get good marks or something, like you know, all of those kind of things would appear. Um, I even got, my, one of my uncles offered me a job uh, as a plant manager somewhere. And, and, and he said, look, it's at, le at least it's, it's gonna pay you something. It was 25,000 rupees a month. And it was hard to tell him that I don't want to do it because he would so passionately brought that job for me, because he saw me that I'm struggling, because I, you know, 
if you try to do an entrepreneurship that day and you say, I have a dream, that means you're foolish. And so you, you fight the middle class in a very uh, middle class mentality of yours in a, you know, in some shape and form. You also are not very planned about your dream. Like, you know, I don't think dreams need to be planned and I don't think ours was also planned. But it was certainly not as big as what it is today, by the way. Just to be clear, I think we started off with modest enough dreams to say, look, we'll do something. Actually, there, was, there would be times at which we would say, hope we'll just survive. And so you're fighting between the need to survive barely to doing something somewhat meaningful. And that, that became a large portion of what we thought was, you know, what we were, we, we, were, we were dealing with. And at that point of time, we did, we started off a business which was in the, uh, which was related to the SMS business. It has something to do with the SMS business. We, our first business, by the way, was called M Coach. And that business of SMS, I thought was phenomenal because, you know, there were like, everybody in those days was just SMSing around left, right, and center. And, you know, I thought, this is it. Look, I've cracked onto a great opportunity. I'm gonna make this, this really big. Six months into that play, we realized that this business is not gonna go anywhere. And the biggest thing that we realized in, the biggest problem that we realized at that point of time was, as entrepreneurs, you need to essentially look for where the ball is going to be versus where the ball is. And we made that mistake. We went after where the ball was. But the ball was moving. It's a game of chess. The ball is moving. You're trying to find your place, but the ball just moved away from you in six months and suddenly we could see that we would not have a business. And so we made, you know, a bold decision, what I would call then, I think it was absurd then, but certainly bold today, of shutting that business down. You know, we spent almost 24 hours hold it, hold, held up in a room and said, look, if we do this, it's going to be a small scale, 10, 20, 50 crore business in the best case scenario. And we, are, we were in our late 20s. Why even attempt something which is going to be small in the best case scenario, why not go for something really big? And I think our big moment there was when we actually changed the framework on what and how to dream bigger. In those six months, we realized that the effort required to do something small versus the effort required to do something large. It's pretty much similar. It's not that different. You're still gonna work 18 hours a day. You're still going to have sleepless nights. You're gonna still, you know, struggle. So why not just go for something much bigger? And that was probably our first learning. Dream big. And we started to then look at the world very differently. We started to look for the world on what the world would be, not the world as it is. And we said, in that, in, in, you know, in 2008, we said, we really want to go after the, the space on the mobile internet. Uh, a lot of you would remember 2008 wasn't the year when mobile internet was large, but we made that bet. It was, again, it was not based on, you know, a lot of data. And that gets me to my second, you know, so-called important thing that I felt is very important in entrepreneurship. It is making decisions based on gut versus looking for data to try and make your decisions, especially if you are dealing with a world where technology is important, where you're looking at the world where technology changes and cycles in technology are going to change your businesses, which by the way today is going to be true for every business. Irrespective of the business you're starting, you know, either you know, technology is going to disrupt your business in a time period shorter than what you're imagining today. So that's gonna happen. And so we made certain gut decisions at that point of time and it was important, that's the second big thing that we, we felt that was critical for us is to you know, make, start making some decisions based on our gut. And we said, look, we're gonna go after the mobile internet space. We, go, we want to build one of the important pillars that makes mobile internet consumption you know, widespread. We realized and questioned that what can we do that can make content free on mobile? And we realized that we, if we can build out an advertising business, advertising platform 
then content out there in the world could be free. It sounded pretty okay, just that there were a few flaws in that argument. Flaw number one, there was no mobile internet. Flaw number two, India didn't really have a big internet uh, advertising market. And third, we went out to talk to all the investors. They all sent me back. So I did 41 meetings, 41 VCs, met 41 venture capitalists. And everyone said no. And this is when I knew them, by the way. Like they were from my business school and all of those things, so they were friends also. So they politely kicked me out, not, you know, not really kicked me out. They politely kicked me out. And that's very hard. And I think the, the first thing that you learn as an entrepreneur, and I'm pretty sure all of you here are entrepreneurs, is how hard is no. And dealing with no is what is very important. And I think in those four months, we were so used to the no that if somebody ever said yes, we would not have, we would have missed it. We would just walk past it because it was habit. You know, it's just a habit. And I still remember, you know, I, I, I walked into a meeting at, um, in, uh, in, well, I was doing a lot of this in, in India and people in India weren't buying the whole thesis on that internet would be there. But when I, then I took a flight, somehow took a flight to the US and, and tried to convince people there. Then they said, yeah, yeah of course, internet is gonna be there on the mobile phone. What are you talking about? That's no news. That's old news. But you live in India. We don't want to back somebody in India because you know there is no talent in India. India only does services. So if we tell you to essentially punch some number 55,000 55, times, you'll do a great job at it. You cannot create anything in India. So we'll not, we'll not invest behind you. So now we are dealing with the second issue of perception. That's not good, by the way. You know, entrepreneurship, we want to reduce the number of things that, that are impacting you, but we were dealing with that. So we went, we kept on, we still didn't give up, and we kept on talking and talking and talking to the investors. One fine day, one investor basically, and apparently happened to be the world's best investor, which was Kleiner Perkins at that point of time, said to us, well, we like what you're doing. We will invest some, I, I think at that point of time, godly, some 40, 50 crores in your business. The problem was I had that point of time one lakh rupee left in my bank account. And I, what I didn't know is how to deal with the time it would take us to convert the money into the bank because that's a process. We didn't have money to hire the lawyers, we didn't have a lot of those things. And I think those are things which build you as an entrepreneur because in those early days, when you try and make these things happen, it makes you ready for a much bigger fight. But I think at that point of time, at, at that point when we got our first boost of confidence, we were revived to a great extent. The revival was of two things. One was that we are going to dream big, so we were already starting to do that. And that we are gonna make certain decisions which are going to be large, magnificent, and are going to be different. We made three decisions in 2008 that I think were uh, you know, foundational to who we are today. The first decision we made was obviously that we are going to back a mobile internet story which was not necessarily true at that point of time, which happens to be true today. Second, we said we are going to build a product company from India and nobody was willing to back us. Everybody called us, you know, that, you know, why don't you just shift to the US, it's much better, you get better talent. Our thesis was, unless until you give our people an attempt, a chance, they'll never be able to prove themselves. And we have to give it to them. We have to give our engineers a chance to create products that can be at global stage. And we took that bet. And I think it worked out really well for us because today, everything that we create is, based, is built from, from Bangalore. Every product that we create is built from Bangalore. Today our products touch on a daily basis anywhere between one and a half billion people to two billion people. And all of those products are created from Bangalore. And it took us two years extra probably to get those things right. But I'm glad we did that because it has probably set, a, you know, set in motion a set of people who are very confident that they can build global scale products that can match the likes of big companies out there. So we, we feel that we made that one big decision, second big decision in, in, you know, in that phase. The third big decision we made based on our gut, and there was no data to prove that, that we're gonna build a global business. 
Like people have issues of cultural differences between Bombay and Delhi. And now we are talking about saying, hey, we are going to try and build a global business. Half of us, half of the team had never been outside of India. But we made that decision and, and I'm glad we made that decision. It was, again, not a conventional decision then. But it is the, it is today the bedrock of who we are. We, we are today in about, uh, you know, we have offices in about 24 countries uh, with about a third of our team based in different countries out there with, you know, almost like 200 people in China. And we made those decisions because we felt we cannot use, as entrepreneurs, you cannot just always do pattern recognition. Our minds are trained too well to recognize patterns. And then we essentially draw a straight line as we see those patterns and say, this is what it must be. But in entrepreneurship, you have to essentially not believe in that all the time. You have to somewhere believe that maybe that's not going to be true and, and that's, that's an important thing to change. Those three things, by the way, led to our growth, massive growth. You know, we, from 2000, I would say nine, to 2012, 13, we grew whatever, 200, 300% year on year, very, very large scale growth. We, we saw some of the best work that we had done at that point of time come to fruition. We were aggressive in markets, we were opening new markets, we were making a lot of mistakes, but speed was the key for us at that point of time. Speed of movement was very critical for us and we said, we will not compromise the space of movement even if we make few mistakes at that, at that stage. And that effectively then, you know, we, we, we led the next round of capital. Uh, you know, SoftBank led a round for us at about $200 million of uh, investment into us. And that's when we, you know, I, I actually didn't know the term unicorn then. And people say, hey, you're a unicorn. I, I had to look it up, uh, what that even meant. But we did grow quite a lot. And so, if you see the phase one of us was all about, you know, dreaming. It's all about dreams. Maybe I'll be a little foolish. In, in, and by the way, I actually believe, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, you don't need to be smart. You just need to be somewhat foolish. And that's when you'll succeed. The second phase was all about making decisions based on, on gut. And making and backing those decisions. Because in those, at those times, there will be en enough and more number of people who will come and tell you that, see, I told you so, because they're not going to go right. And I think at that point of time, to be able to go back and say, I will hold on to the decision that I'm making is very important. I think staying true to your decision is very, very critical in those, in those stages, because if you start listening to a lot of people, then you are essentially the best version of an average that is going to get created out there. So essentially, making and staying to your decisions became very true, and therefore speed was very critical to us. We grew quite a lot. And that kind of got us to, uh, in around 2014 or so, we were you know, on a phenomenal ride. And that gets me to our next phase of what I would call the shock of entrepreneurship. Whatever we thought we were doing till then, we thought that is the, that you just continue that. You know, you see, we had hit like, uh, you know, we, we were seeing success because we were launching new markets, we were launching new products, and, you know, we were kind of just going bang, bang, bang. And we thought we just continue to do that. Like, why stop? Let's do more bang, 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 right? <laughs> why stop? And then suddenly, it stopped. And I think for the first time in our, in our life, for the, you know, for about five, four, five, six years that, that we were in, we saw what I would say a tough period. Business didn't grow. Customers left. Markets, we weren't gaining market share anymore. We were just hanging on to the markets. And it was, it shocked me. I thought I was doing everything right. There was like, there was no, there was no, there was no challenge because, you know, we, you know, I did the same thing two years ago. I'm just doing more of it now. Now I had more money, so I'm going to do more of it. And I realized at that point of time, few things. The first thing that I realized was, oh, by the way, this phase taught me the meaning of grit and perseverance. Every day, probably in those, that year or two years, I wanted to quit. I think everybody else also wanted to quit. Because, you know, you're not on a high anymore. 
business obviously as i said you know was 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 on a downward slope media wrote our obituary now one of the challenges with media as entrepreneurship is they can pull you up and they can pull you down and both sides of that equation are incorrect by the way because when they throw you up you're really not that up and when they throw you down you're really not that much down so you're like somewhere in between but you're swinging this much so not just the fact that the business is tanking you also had media slapping every day with you know front page et news coming out to say hey everybody has quit hey this has happened and now you're going through this phase you have no idea what to do literally i was lost there was no other word for it i was lost and i think there began what i would call the the best journey for us in the at that point of time our best journey started at that point now i say that today not then then i just was maybe i'm lost and i felt that for a very long period of time and what i would say is that period of was a was a period of soul searching and there were a few things that we were trying to to soul search i think one what are we doing what are we doing we realized that we had become brats you know as a child if you're overfed with money abundance and abundance of it what do you do whatever you want to do and that's pretty much what we were doing we had abundance of capital with us so we had become brats we were mocking all the things that any sustainable business does we had no financial discipline we had no prioritization we had no discipline on how to build a company so the first thing we tried to fix was to say let's not run out of money it's important and let's try to make sure that we get these principles in place on day one and in today's world by the way in today's world of entrepreneurship we are laden with that because money has become a commodity if you have a half decent idea and you want 100 dollars you will get 500 and that has created inaccurate incorrect unsustainable business models after business models because a very simple equation of any business is lifetime value of a customer minus the cost of customer acquisition should be positive we just felt that it can remain negative and someone some day will come in and make it positive for us no you have to make it positive you have to essentially figure out the unit economics of your business actually works it's basic principle you know how she's sitting here and he would be just saying what is what is wrong with you guys like don't you know this but it is true because you know in this whole world because you have so much glitterati is going around you that you miss out on some basic principles the second thing we realized the truth of business is free cash flow previous to that we thought the truth of business is venture capital money you keep going and you keep opening it up and saying bring me more bring me more and they'll keep giving it to you you don't know the day it stops what happens because you're not prepared for it so that happened so we said we are going to be we are going to be self sustainable business so the first thing in that period we said is we need to build an organization which is self sustainable now it's easier said than done but it was very very hard because trying to essentially what were you trying to do you're trying to change behaviors people who are spending money in trying to build technologies hiring machines testing out products innovation which was which would just go on for like 2 years and give no results all of that was happening so that's why i say we were brats we had to fix ourselves so it was self time for self discipline and i think we went through that hard phase of self discipline to fix ourselves the second thing we we looked for is what kind of organization we want to build and we realized at that time that we were actually a transient organization 
like one more bad hit, we would be out. We were playing T20, frankly. We were playing T20. Frankly, you need to play test matches. This is a test match. And we were not, we were not prepared for it. And so we decided, and I'll come back to that in a minute, we decided that if we have to do anything in this organization, the organization needs to be something that lasts for generations, firstly. Secondly, in the world that we are in, technology, is, technology changes are rapid. Why did we lose business, by the way? We lost business because we did not innovate. We lost business because we were just sitting on our laurels and saying, whatever we had done is great. But if you have a technology business, which is what I mentioned earlier, that any business today is a technology business, frankly, the disruption cycle comes and hits you so fast and so hard that the whole foundation shakes up. Our foundation had shaken. And so, if we want to be a sustainable organization outside of just pure financial you know, discipline, you had to have a discipline of innovation. Now, discipline of innovation or disruption is not going to happen just because you said so. It is not going to happen because you're going to put a lot of capital to work. By the way, on the contrary, capital is the exact, more number of capital is inversely proportional, capital is inversely proportional to innovation. Innovation only happens when you have scarcity of resources. Now, I read, those, I read those things in the books, by the way. I did. I'm sure all of you did. I also ignored it. I actually said that is for the losers. I'm a rock star. I will be able to do it despite, you know, not scarcity. I used to give those speeches then also, by the way. I've changed it now, clearly. And so, we realized that if innovation has to happen, you have to focus on not on capital, you have to focus on another resource called people. And so the, the, the big change that we decided to drive for us was we decided to understand our people. Culture is the only thing that drives innovation. Nothing else will drive your innovation in the organization that you're in. And we realized that what we had built as a culture was a culture, and by the way, all the things that we had built as part of our culture, as part of our HR systems and processes, were all the things that we had read in the books. But all of those books were written not in the era of technology disruption, not in the era where the disruption cycles were so fast and so rapid and so, so magnificent. Those were written in an era when things moved at their own pace. Things moved slow. So none of those people practices were, 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 were applicable anymore. You had to come up with new people practices, but there was nobody to tell you what those people practices would be. And so we started to essentially go back to the principle of saying, why do people come to work? What do they really want to do in life? And we realized that we had created an organization which can do anything but innovation. Why? You know, we had this, uh, I'll give you a few examples. We actually, we actually said that we trusted our people. But in reality, we never trusted our people. The reason for that was, we would essentially go out there and talk about, you know, we would have these, uh, you know, uh, variable pay, the bonuses pay out, and we would tell people, you know, in the beginning of the quarter, can you tell me what you will do at the end of the quarter? Now that you have told me at the end of the quarter, I'll come back at the end of the quarter and say, did you achieve what you said you'll do at the end of the quarter? If you achieved it, I'll pay you 100%. If you did not achieve it, I'll not pay you. That's the classical method. What is the fallacy in this method? The fallacy in this method is, if you're trying to do innovation, that's the exact thing that you cannot predict. You cannot predict the outcome at the end of three months. If you're trying to build new things, no one knows when it'll come out. But what were we doing? We were essentially telling people, you know, be fearful because you will lose your money if you do not tell me what you will do. So therefore, everybody was saying, you know, we are at X, we'll be at X plus delta. We were never moving to the Y. 
we were never changing the plane. And therefore, we had lost the plot. And all of those things, by the way, were things that were told to us in the business schools and all of these places, and we, we were implementing them. So we were really not trusting our people. We did not trust our people to even pay for hotel bills, by the way. We would have a much bigger process out there to manage the hotel bills and the reimbursement then really figure out are they innovating or not. And we call, we used to call this, we, we had an internal name for this, we used to call this 1% versus 99%. We had created these rules because the 1% of the people were breaking the rules but were affecting the 99% of the people because we were at broad level were essentially showcasing we do not trust you. So while we had a bunch of these things, trust us, things written on the wall, what was happening in the halls was exactly the opposite. We also really didn't care for our people, by the way. Innovation happens when people are fearless. In order to be fearless, you have to care for them. We didn't care for our people. We are brutal. So we changed. Over a year, we changed. We made massive changes. Like the only thing, if you, if you were to ask me, that we really fixed was the culture. And then when somebody told me, and we have all read this, that what is that culture eat strategy for breakfast or something like that, right? Something, some, it is true. It is true. Strategy is transient. Culture is far more permanent. And we did many, many changes in our organizations, which were very fundamental to essentially be an in innovation-led organization. We removed, we removed the performance management system from our company. We said this is, just, this is just bad. We are trying to do this performance management of people who are very driven. They want to succeed. They are not people who do not want to work. They actually want to work. They actually want to, they want to do the right things. You have to fundamentally believe in people and trust them. We didn't. So we removed the performance management system. We said there will be no performance management systems in the company anymore. So we now have a blank sheet of paper. We removed the concept of you know, paying out of bonuses. We said everybody gets 100%. We removed every inhibition that people may have to say, you want a holiday, take it. You don't want to come to work, don't come. Just do what you think you want to do. And that changed. That changed us. That changed us as a company, that changed us drastically, and probably gave us what, what I can now today say gave us a lot of strength, but at that point in time, it was all experiments. Again, we were partly going based on our gut, on what we thought is the right thing to do within the organization, but we felt that it is at least more aligned to where we want the company to, to go towards. All of those things, you know, from the dream to making these, you know, fun decisions to scaling based on those decisions, to this humbling experience of, you know, kind of being shown the mirror that you really don't stand a chance, to kind of fighting through this. I think when we, when we fought through this period was probably the, the best period for us. We had the least attrition in that period. Nobody left us. Why people want a good fight? You tell them that we are going to fight and win, they want that. People want to see, to create something. People want to, people want to make an impact. And people, at the most fundamental level, are humans. And they just want to be treated like humans. Just humans. And that's what we did. We basically treated people like humans and not like employees. And I just don't like this word, frankly, employees, because it is basically like a cost system. At the end of the day, it is how human interactions will drive these things. So we changed. All of that, by the way, gave us a lot of confidence, a lot of core confidence that we can actually make things back again. So what happened? In 2016, I, I by the way, also became very transparent with the company. I would tell them everything. In my town halls, I would show them the cash balance also. Loss, profit, loss, revenue, whatever, customer losses, customer wins, everything was up for everyone to see. Even till date, by the way, 2,000 people can log in and see everything. 
but I also told them what I want to do. So made it their problem. So from losing $20 million a quarter, we're losing $20 million a quarter, which meant if we did a lot of that, like there was not that many we could do, frankly. Another two or three quarters and we should be out, like dead. From losing $20 million a quarter, in 45 days, we became profitable. 45 days. Shows two things. One, how bad we were. Like how pathetically bad we were, right, in, in what we were doing. Second, the power of collective wisdom of people bringing together as a mission to say we will make this happen came to fruition. So we became profitable and we have remained profitable since then. That was the financial discipline part. On the innovation part, in our core business of advertising, we started to innovate and we created newer and newer and newer products. For every new product that we are creating, our team size was going down. In the world of innovation today, you do not need large size teams. Frankly, you need small size teams in order to innovate. You need people who have end-to-end -end ownership, people who can think through everything and can make things happen. So for every new thing that we were innovating on, earlier our team size would be 50 people. Now our team size would be five to seven people. And we started to see results. Fast, iterative results. Innovation, frankly, is all about iterations. You can't predict an innovation. You can't predict that something will happen. All you can predict is to say, I will do a lot of this every day, day in and day out, and something will happen. Something somewhere will work. And so we moved our business from an advertising only business by adding, and I will not bore you with the complexity of it, but from a media, we added a software business to it also, which made our business far more deeper in the stack. What it did is that our relationship with our customers became very deep. That component of the business led to a massive partnership that we did with Microsoft, which I was, you know, at the backstage I was talking about. We did a massive partnership with Microsoft, which is probably worth, if it all works out fine, it will be worth billions of dollars for us. But it was based on 14 months of innovation that we had done because those pieces were the ones that Microsoft said, whoa, no one is doing this in the globe. You guys are doing it the best. Can we work with you? And here is a full-blown business that we could give you. We didn't plan for that. What we planned for was to innovate. The result was an outcome of that innovation that actually happened. And so we felt very happy about that business, that business of ours. And today, if I were to fast forward, based on all the innovation that we have done, last year we have announced that Inmobi is now, we, we created a group structure. We now have three companies within our portfolio. The first was our Inmobi, the advertising business where we did a lot of these things. The amount of innovation that we have done you know, we ourselves are surprised by it. Teams come back with proven products and they show it to us. That's what's, that is what innovation is in my mind, by the way. When you don't, we are not the bottleneck. You are a mere provider of resources if you see something happening. Financial and people resources. Those are the only things that you could really do if the organization at large scale is, is, is innovative. So that started to happen for us. That business has become massively large for us. We'll try to figure out, you know, in two years, we'll try to take that business, you know, IPO. The team then worked. There was a team of, uh, we have a second company which is called Glance. Uh, it's today the fastest growing consumer application in India. Uh, it's been nine months that we are out. It's an AI-led product. We beat Instagram last week, last month, in terms of scale in India, in terms of usage. And what we did was to essentially say that we want to change the way everyone consumes content on their phones. We fundamentally believe that this app ecosystem is archaic. You kind of open the phone and you keep clicking on these apps. With all the data that we are leaving behind, there has to be a way for us to essentially be able to stream content that you need to see without you having to look for it right onto your screen. 
that was built in you know in three years. Today, we have 65 million daily active users in that business. In India, our scale is WhatsApp, Facebook, YouTube, and Glance. And that's what innovation does. 11 member team, 11 member team build that product. It's a multi, multi billion dollar business for us. And we just raised you know, boatloads of capital for that business, et cetera. But at the heart of it was driving innovation and also driving a disruption that nobody else was able to see. And then we have a third business that we created in the last three years itself. It's called, the, bus it's, the business is called True Factor. That business is us providing, it's a data business. It's a very deep stack data business. Very, very deep infrastructure, technology infrastructure business, software, data business. And that business also got created because there was a handful of people who saw an opportunity because of something that we were doing in our core business to say, look, we can build this out here. And if we can build this business, then it'll be a very, very large opportunity out there. It's, it's the, in the data side of that business, and again, I won't bore you with the complexity of that business, but in the data side of that business, in the US is by the way where we've only launched this business, it's the fastest growing business in that category, in its own category. Again, today, that team is about 50 member team, but at the time they, they worked on this, it was 25 member team. Again, a multi-billion dollar business in the making. And so to me, one of the things that I realized over this last 10 or 11 years, there are multiple paths that one can choose. A path of capital raising and raising and raising and buying out market share through, through that. The reality is that that strategy has not played out well. The strategy that has made America great in terms of the businesses that they've created has been based on fundamental innovation. And I think what we were able to see over the last few years is how innovation leads to fundamental value creation at rapid pace. But at the time when it's happening, you just don't know that it's really happening. And so to me, today where the Inmobi group stands, I think based on all the innovation that we have done over the next two years or so, the, the overall group would be anywhere around 12 to 15 billion dollars of value. But none of that was created based on raising capital. All of that was done based on innovation. And I think we are sitting in a country where talent is at mass. We're sitting in a market which is also becoming much larger. We're sitting in a room which is full of entrepreneurs. We also have to realize that in this world, if we have to win, we have to essentially look at innovation very differently. And all of us out here, ourselves plus our teams, have immense talent to create that innovation. And I think the only way for us to grow, and India is probably ripe for it, is to grow through this level of innovation that can actually change the world. We have a very interesting opportunity as Indians sitting out of India to innovate for Asia to begin with. To innovate for Asia because if you do that job right, India is a large enough market for sure, but you add the Southeast Asian markets and Middle Eastern markets and if you innovate into those markets, we are here to stay and we are here to create some of the largest companies that the country has seen over the next 10 years. And the technology cycles are in our favor, the talent is in our favor, our home market is in our favor, and the only thing I could say to this room out here is, you know, hopefully each one of you take this core piece and try and figure out how that can be done over the next few years because what that will create will change the world. With that, thank you so much, and thank you, Harsh, for inviting me here. Thank you.